Hello, everyone that's joining into our live webinar. We are uh, happy to see you guys signing in. Thank you so much for joining us. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. It's now 6.4. We're going to allow a few minutes for people to trickle in and also for people to sign into our Facebook page where you are currently live. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be starting in a little bit less than five minutes. I am at the moment saving our contact information in the, in the chat. You can reach out to us at 305-371-8846 if you're interested in um, discussing any of the topics um, of the webinar from today, the SB 17 law or any other immigration matter that you would like to bring to our attention. Okay, so we are just a few moments away to starting our discussion today on how SB 1718 will affect businesses in Florida. Um, this is a very top, important topic of discussion for business owners and also for people who are currently living in Florida and have questions about how 1718 will or may impact uh, daily life for them as well. Yeah. So we are obviously based in Miami, Florida, um, but we have clients and family members, you know, all over. 
Um, we have clients where maybe they're in New York, but their family members are in Florida and they're worried about this new law. Um, we've been having a lot of questions pouring into our firm. because, As everyone knows, this new immigration law went into effect in Florida on July 1st. So there's been a lot of inquiries. Um, we received quite a number of inquiries from businesses of all sizes. So small businesses and big corporations on how is this new DeSantis immigration law really gonna imp impact our day-to-day -day when it comes to making sure that our documentations are in order and that we're following the proper procedures as we you know, continue to hire people and as the businesses are trying to grow in Florida. So we're really looking forward to diving in a little bit more about this and giving some information. Um, so we're here as a resource for the community and really looking forward to having this conversation. Thank you so much for that introduction. It's um, So I see people are joining us um, little by little. Uh, we're happy to keep waiting. I think let's give it another five minutes just to wait for a little bit. Um, just to allow people some time to, to join and we'll get started. Um, as you already know, you can reach out to us at 305-371-8846. Our um, website is elisealawfirm.com. Uh, you will find resources there where you can give us a call. Uh, our phone number is there, our email address is there as well. Um, yeah, and we'll be more than happy to assist you with whatever you might need. So just so people are aware, um, we are an immigration firm, the Elise Law Firm. We're located in Miami, Florida. We help a lot of immigrants from all over the world, whether they're in Miami, New York, California, Haiti, Europe, South America, from all over. And we've decided to initiate these monthly webinars to kind of address the concerns that we're seeing um, in the community and from the calls that we're getting in. So last month we discussed, you know, the immigration options through a family-based petition, because there was a lot of questions about the di different parole programs. And today with um, being July and the implementation of this new law, we wanted to make sure to educate folks about how this new law is gonna impact our communities in Florida, our families from all over and especially businesses. I think we can go ahead and get started and um, we'll just make sure to post this video on our Facebook as well as our face, our YouTube page and our website so that anyone who wasn't able to log in today will be able to have access to it later on. Thank you so much for that attorney. So let's get started then. Uh, welcome everyone to our second webinar. Uh, we've been hosting these since the end of May. And we're very excited to start this new series where we'll be able to talk about, you know, topics of discussion that are very important in terms of immigration and, um, you know, to our clients and to future clients, or if you are simply interested in the topic of immigration, uh, welcome. Uh, so for today, I'd like to introduce you to our firm. We are Elise Law Firm, uh, located in Miami, Florida. Our website is eliselawfirm.com and our phone number is 305-371-8846 for anybody who's interested in reaching out to us um, after this webinar. Uh, so on that note, I'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation with you guys. Great. Okay, so for today's topic of discussion, we will be touching base on how uh, SB 1718 will affect businesses, and on that note, how it will affect business owners, and also 
employees of said businesses. Um, our attorney is our managing attorney. Her name is Patricia Elise. She will be the one who is going to be guiding us through today's uh, topic of discussion. Uh, she's <clears throat> graduated from the University of Washington School of Law. Um, we have multiple publications uh, available on our website as well for you to reach out to us in media appearances where you have possibly seen the attorney aside from Instagram where she's very popular as well. Um, so let's move on to what is SB 1718? Great. So um, most people know this law as the DeSantis immigration law. The formal title for it is SB 1718. It's a Florida law that went into effect on July 1st. One second. Okay. Um, so this law is actually going to impact a few different areas in Florida. Today, we're really going to focus on how it's going to impact business owners and businesses. But for example, one major change are, is going to impact hospitals, right? So any hospital in Florida that takes Medicaid, they are now required to ask all patients for their immigration status. Um, this is upon the patient arriving to the hospital to be admitted for anything they have to ask the patient for their immigration status. The law says that the hospital also has to make it clear to the patient that their immigration status will not be shared with um, immigration. And also that it's not gonna impact the level of care that immigration is going to, that the hospital is going to give them. But you know, it's gonna be very daunting and scary, you know, if you're an immigrant without status in Florida going to the hospital and seeing, you know, a, an official document where it's asking you for your status. Um, so the immigrant is gonna have different options, either it being, you have to put, whether you're a US citizen or a lawful permanent resident, whether you have no immigration status or whether you refuse to answer. So a lot of advocates are actually asking people to, whether you're, an, you're a US citizen or not, to put down, um, you refuse to answer so that we can support people that have no status at all that are actually going to the hospitals. Um, Bernie, one of the questions that comes up with this topic is, will something happen as a consequence of choosing to not answer that question? So no, um, there will be no consequence in the hospital of you if anyone chooses not to answer that question. It will still, the hospital still be required to give them a great level of care, um, and they will not be reported to ICE or to immigration. So on a practical level, no, there's not gonna be any consequences, but it's still very intimidating, right? If you're physically in Florida, you have no legal status, and the hospital is asking you to put on paper what your immigration status is. Um, one of the reasons that, according to DeSantis, he's doing this is so that they can keep track of how much money hospitals are actually spending on giving care to those that are undocumented. What is it exactly they're gonna do with those reports? That's not clear as of yet. Another change that the law is putting into effect is that driver's license that is issued to undocumented immigrants from other states will no longer be valid as a form of ID. So a driver's license is something that is regulated per state and each state has different requirements as to what they want to see to be able to give you a driver's license. So some states will actually give you a driver's license regardless of your immigration status. For example, California, you don't have to show that you're currently in lawful status. Um, if you have ID and if you meet the other requirements that they have in California, they will give you a driver's license. Up until July 1st, when you were in Florida, that driver's license was recognized. So starting July 1st, if you're driving in Florida without, you know, a driver's license that also um, require you to give evidence of your immigration status, Florida will not recognize that driver's license and that officer that stops you will not be required to actually give you a ticket. Um, another big change when it comes to IDs is that Florida now makes it illegal for any um, local government entity to provide funding for community IDs. So community IDs were 
you know, very popular when it comes to local municipalities or nonprofit organizations. They would they would put these identification cards so that immigrants that are unlawfully present in Florida would be able to present it, you know, a type of ID that has their name and their a photo so that they can use it for day-to-day -day use, even though they're not using it for driving. Community IDs are still acceptable. You're still allowed to do them. However, um, any government entity now is no longer able to give funding for those community IDs. Um, the next point has had a lot of coverage in the media, and this is where a lot of people had a lot of concerns, which is when it comes to transporting undocumented, per undocumented persons in Florida. Now, to be clear, if you're physically already in Florida, and let's say you're driving around, you're going from your house to the doctor's office, or you're going to school, and you have someone that's in your car, that's okay, that's not illegal, okay? What it is illegal under this law is for you to knowingly enter Florida and transport someone into the state that you know or should have known is undocumented. So, um, there's been a lot of rumors that you're not able to house anyone in your at home anymore. You're not able to drive anyone that doesn't have a formal ID. That is not the case. The only thing that is now illegal is that you're not able to come into the state with someone that you know is unlawfully here in the United States. Okay. Um, another change that we're really going to focus on today is the requirements of verification of um, if someone is able to work physically, work in Florida or not under the immigration laws. So under this new law, um, if you are an entity and you provide any services to a local government agency, or if you are a private company and you employ 25 people or more, then you're now required to use E-Verify on top of an I-9 form. And again, we'll definitely get into that a lot more later in the presentation. And lastly, there's a lot of harsh economic san sanctions that are being put in place for businesses that fail to comply mm -hmm. with these new regulations. So um, you'll see further on that, that sometimes um, if you don't follow these regulations, you may be at risk of actually losing your license to operate your business in Florida. Wow, that's, that's actually pretty harsh. Um... So actually one of the questions that comes up is for, regarding the community IDs, is this something that uh, we would be able to, you know, talk a little bit more about towards the end of the presentation? Is this something that would allow us to eventually uh, get uh, authorization or not authorization, but rather would allow us to apply for a job in the case of employees? No, so the community ID is simply that it's an identification card. It's not coming from the state of Florida. It's not coming from the federal government. It's coming from a nonprofit organization that's giving you some type of identification card that you can use socially and at any um, you know, nonprofit or any organization that's actually gonna accept it. You're not gonna be able to use it to drive. You're not gonna be able to use it to actually apply for a job or anything of that nature. So that's a really great question. Okay, great. So let's focus a little bit more on the actual, on the driver's licenses. As you see on this map, there's 18 plus states. So there's 18 states plus Washington, DC, who, where they currently allow and they give driver's licenses to folks that are technically undocumented or have unlawful status. So for example, you see California, Washington state, Oregon, Nevada, New York, um, those are some of the states right now, if you have one of those driver's licenses and you come into the state of Florida, those driver's licenses are not going to be recognized in the state of Florida. Attorney, uh, I believe you're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry. So um, one of the exceptions to this driver's license regulation is if you are working for the federal government, for example, for any reason, and you are driving in the state of Florida um, for your job, 
then you're gonna be exempt from this regulation. If you have some type of commercial license, for example, you will also be exempt from this regulation. So if you have a license from another state and you're working for the federal government, if you have a license from another state and you have a commercial license that allows you to drive, you may be exempt from this regulation as well. And if you're driving a farm, if you're driving a farm tractor, then you will also be exempt from this regulation. Attorney, just so you know, this may be this may seem like an obvious question, but I think it's actually a very good question. Um, with the exceptions in place, what if somebody's driving, you know, with an Oregon driver's license in the state of Florida, but they're on vacation? I landed. I wanted to rent a car. This just sounds a little bit crazy um, to hear that. So, what, what's your take on that? So this is this is really where we're going to see a lot of discrepancies on how these regulations are going into effect. Um, because don't forget, the people who are actually going to be implementing them are going to be the police officers, right? So the Florida troopers. Um, it's going to be up to them to ask the necessary questions to determine whether the person that they stop is going to be subject to this regulation or not. So to be honest, I don't know, we don't really know on a practical level how some of these regulations are going to come into play. Mm -hmm. But just it's always great um, to err in caution, right? So if you do have a driver's license from another state and you just so happen to fall within one of these um, exemptions, but you're not working, you shouldn't be driving in Florida. You want to be safe, right? Because you don't want to be in a situation where you're being pulled over, you're getting a ticket. Um, and then from there, the officer is going to have the discretion, right, to take it as far as that officer would like. So this really opens up a great, a great topic. Um, immigration is a federal law. Immigration, who regulates immigration is the federal government, not the state. So what the state of Florida right now is doing, it's really trying to impact as much as it, as it can, how state actors are going to be reacting to undocumented immigrants. So it's not that it's changing immigration law. The state of Florida is not able to change immigration law. What it's doing is trying to have an impact on what they can control. Um, businesses in Florida, driver's licenses in Florida, IDs, et cetera, things like that. Okay. All right, thank you so much for the clarification on that, attorney. I'm gonna move on to the next topic, which is going to be what you just brought up, which is particularly what industries are going to be impacted most by this new Florida law. Um, can you please go into a little bit more detail with that? Sure. So as what we see right in Florida is the agricultural, the hospitality and the construction industries are the three industries that are going to be impacted the most, because those are the industries that use undocumented immigrants to supplement their workforce. Um, and most of these industries, they're not really hiring people for the most part, they're not hiring people year round. So you'll see that they'll hire them per season, right? So that's obvious for an agricultural. So it just, just depends on, you know, where we have a lot of oranges in Florida. So there's a season for that. They're not going to hire year round um, for the hospitality industry. So President Trump was actually very famous um, in the immigration sector, not for all of the changes that he made, but he actually increased the number of um, short-term seasonal worker visas that were available because he's in the hospitality industry and he needed more seasonal workers. So um, this is hotels, um, restaurants, you know, theme parks, et cetera. So anyone in the hospitality industry is really gonna be impacted as well. Um, as well as construction, I'm sure everyone has seen the TikTok videos of the construction sites being vacant, and that's because the undocumented folks are scared to show up because they're scared of how this law is going to impact them on a day-to-day -day basis. That is entirely true. There's so much on the news nowadays about how people are simply not showing up for work out of fear, 
And you brought up a very interesting topic, which is the topic of visas as an alternative. And I think we're gonna to touch base on that a little bit further later on in today's presentation, attorney. Thank you for bringing that up. So um, I really wanna highlight one of the main purposes of this bill and of this new law, which is really to um, really punish, that's, that's the word, is to really punish any business in Florida that employs unauthorized aliens, right? And I wanna read straight from, from, the, from the law so that everyone has a great understanding and we're on the same page. So firstly, if an employer has knowingly employed an unauthorized alien without verification of employment eligibility, then the Department of Economic Opportunity must. So this is really important. They've changed the law because at first, if it was your first offense, for example, there was more wiggle room as to whether you were gonna be um, charged or put on probation. But this law now makes it a necessity. The Department of Economic Opportunity must enter an order of repayment of any economic development incentives and shall place the employer on a one-year probation, right? Um, so here, if there's random checks or if it comes to the Department of Economic opportunities viewing that for some reason you're not checking everyone's um, work permits, if you're not keeping track of your I-9s, if you're not um, actually using E-Verify, if you're required to, if for any reason they're able to show that you knowingly employed someone or you failed to verify the employment, there's now an, they're now obligated to put you on a one-year probation. And you can also be fined to what, whatever incentives so grants, for example, you receive to help your business, you now have to repay. Um, so if that were to happen and within 24 months there's subsequent violations, then there'd be grounds to actually suspend or revoke all of your business licenses. So this is a really big deal for, for business owners. Um, business owners in Florida, especially small businesses, you know, we are juggling so much and, you know, you have to make sure all the bills are paid on time, the employees are showing up, you have your marketing, et cetera. So here they're putting an extra burden, an extra, you know, hassle of making sure that you have to make sure you have a file on every single employee that you hired and you have to keep the documentation in the paper trail because if you don't, you will be subject to possible fines and eventually to being on probation and also possibly losing your license to even operate your business. Um, if for example, there's an employee also that uses a false ID or someone else's ID. Now that employee can be subject to a third degree felony. So that's, that's a really big deal. And what is the definition of an unauthorized alien? Here an unauthorized alien would be an individual who's not authorized under federal law to be employed in the United States. So how the, the logical question now would be, well, how do you know whether someone is authorized under federal law to work in the US or not? Well, um, first of all, obviously everyone knows a US citizen is able to work. A, green, a lawful permanent resident, which is a green card holder is also able to work, but we also have other immigrants in the United States, for example, with pending applications, or maybe they have a temporary status or they have a work visa, they will also be qualified to work under immigration law. And each, each kind of immigrant, each kind of temporary status is gonna be able to provide you know, different documentations to show that they're eligible to work. So this is really where partnering with an immigration attorney to kind of taking, taking over and having that discussion and reviewing the documents that are, um, handed over by your employee is gonna make a big difference to make sure that you have a professional looking at the documents and verifying whether this employee is authorized under federal law to actually be employed in the US or not. Attorney, I think the key word here is, uh, on the first point that you made was, if the employer has knowingly employed an unauthorized alien. So, you know, is there a way that, 
immigration or the immigration authorities that are enforcing this would be able to know that you knowingly or unknowingly uh, employed? Oh, right. Well, this is the thing. Um, up until July 1st, right? So they're not telling you you have to go back and redo and take a look, a second look at all of the documentation that was already given to you by your for your current employees or your former employees. What they're saying is moving forward. However, there is a section in the law that says, if you know for any reason that someone you've already hired is here unlawfully and you continue to hire them, you continue to keep them on as an employee, that's when you would also be subject to this, to this law. Wow. I think we're losing you there again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, so this is actually a very interesting topic because there's so much um, speculation going on around it. Um, and really only with an immigration attorney would we be able to truly get to the bottom of what it is that is being required of businesses and business owners. So this is definitely a new area of law um, in Florida. There's going to be a lot of um, questions. Not everything is super clear. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the law is also not clear because the Florida law is using a lot of immigration terms that are used on a federal level, but in different way. They're also not defining it. So it's really um, is it's going to be a little confusing for anyone to really know whether they're following it the way that they should, which is a little scary, to be honest, right? <laughs> so at this point, we just have to be vigilant and make sure that as a business, we're doing the best we can. I'm sorry, I think I'm having issues. Let me give me one second. All right, let's just wait for our attorney to come back in just a moment. But just to recap, um, you know, if you have any questions regarding how SB 1718 is going to affect you, your business, or your status as an employee, uh, please feel free to reach out to our firm. Our phone number is 305-371-8846. Our email address is intro, I-N-T-R-O, at elisealawfirm.com. You can reach out to us also directly on our website at elisealawfirm.com. And, um, you know, we'll be able to share with you information about SB 17. Uh, humanitarian parole is another one of the really big questions and inquiries that comes into mind about what people seek us for. And uh, among many other immigration topics, we are an immigration law firm and we are back with our attorney. Sorry about that. Working from home. <laughs> was parking. I think we had an Amazon package that was delivered. <laughs> Don't we know it? <laughs> it's okay. It only makes us human in a post-pandemic age. <laughs> All right. So I think we should move on to the consequent topic. What do you think, attorney? Yeah, that sounds great. All right. Great. So this is a question that we're getting a lot is, who is it exactly that's gonna be impacted by this regulation, right? And it's really only gonna be employees. So this is gonna be someone that you've hired to work with you. You're the one who has control on their position. You're the one that has control on their schedule. Um, as a business owner, you can supervise exactly what they're doing. You've negotiated the salary and the wages. So this is the typical nine to five person who's working for you. As an employee, you have control of the services that they're, they're doing. Um, a contractor, a contractor is also, is similar, right? A contractor though is someone who's gonna be working for a public entity. So for example, if your business is providing services to the city of Miami, 
or um, to a municip municipality, then you're gonna be considered as a contractor and you're also now gonna be under this umbrella under this new regulation where you also have to make sure as a contractor, you are doing E-Verify and you have all of the I-9 forms. So contractors, employees bound by the same conditions. Yes. There is no way around it folks. So reach out to us. We'll be happy to guide you through your process. All right. Now, this is where there's a little bit more wiggle room. Um, this is where we're looking at casual labor and independent contractors. So casual labor, you wanna look at, for example, um, a good example is someone who's coming and cleaning your house once in a while. So a maid, a cleaning person, um, or maybe you have a handyman. The state of Florida is not putting an obligation on you, right? To double check if the cleaning lady has her documents or not. Um, they're considered to be casual labor because it's really once in a while, the work is being done at your private residence and it's not really taking that much time. There's no formal contract. Now an independent contractor. So if you're hiring an independent contractor to work for your business, you don't have the obligation to there to double check the independent contractors immigration status either. Now, the big difference between the independent contractor and an employee is going to be um, whether you actually control or the independent contractor does or not. So if you have someone who's able to come and go on their own, they set their own schedule. Even if you come to an agreement with them as to when they're going to be working from what time to what time, but it's really up to them to set their schedule. And they're also going to be billing you on a regular basis for the work being done. It's not that they're on payroll. So if you have an independent contractor working for you, or if you have for your business, or if you have a casual labor working for you at home, then those two type of um, folks are not go, you don't have the obligation to verify their immigration status. Understood attorney, okay. Um, Great, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. I know that there's some questions regarding this topic, but I think the I-9 and E-Verify that you mentioned earlier are gonna get through those questions. Okay, so attorney, what is E-Verify? So that's that's the million dollar question, right? What is E-Verify and where did it come from? Why do we have to follow it in Florida? Um, E-Verify is actually a federal program and right now it's a pilot program. So this is something that's not even required on a federal level. Um, this should make it, according to immigration, according to the federal government, this is gonna be a great website where you could go in, put in the person's name, put in the documentation that they gave you, put in their information, and you'll get an actual confirmation from the government that the person that you're hiring actually has proper work authorization to work in your business. The problem that we're seeing is sometimes the website's not working. Sometimes it's down or sometimes it gives the wrong answer or um, it's not updated as quickly as you'd like. This so, tends to happen a lot with federal, uh, or with websites that are actually government websites, correct? Correct. So, you know, so, somebody's question is actually a very good question. And it's like, how am I supposed to, depend my business on something that's not even stable, right? So, I think it's more of a hypothetical. So the, with this new law, you have an obligation to actually go on to E-Verify within three days of um, hiring someone. And if for any, so the, the solution is, if for any reason the website is down, it's your obligation to basically take a screenshot or print something that shows the date that you tried to use E-Verify and that the system wasn't working and to just keep trying to use it until you're actually able to get the e-verification done. Is the person able to continue to, to start working or am I going to be eternally sending screenshots to there? <laughs> That's a great question. So um, I would say that the person is able to start, but you need to make sure to keep trying to do the e-verification. And as soon as you see that the e-verification came back okay, then you can allow them to keep working. 
if there's any issues with the answer that you get from E-Verify, then obviously that's the time to stop, but document exactly what you did and go from there. Got it. All right, so what do we need to do in order to get started with E-Verify? What is required? So this is really simple, um, but it does take some time to one, get familiar with the website, collect all your information. Obviously you need your company legal name, you also need your tax ID if you don't have it um, readily available. You can look it up online on sunbiz.org, which is where you're able to look up any business information. So if you have a business in Florida that's registered, if you go on that website, you'll be able to um, look up the business and the tax ID will be there on the website. You can just grab it and use it. You'll need the physical address and um, for the company, mailing address if it's separate, the hiring site, um, the total number of current employees. Now this, the North American industry classification system, a lot of, so some of you may know this as the DUNS number. And when you go on that website, what it does, it'll actually give you, it's a database of all of the different organizations in the US and all the different businesses. And per industry, there's actually a code for the kind of business that you have. So you're able to get that by going online and then you could plug it in to e-verify and your regular um, contact information. So if you have a memorandum of understanding with someone else to actually do the e-verification for you, then you'll also use that. So if you're using you know, a third party like an immigration attorney or an immigration firm to do this, then you'd have an agreement with them and the firm would be the one to actually log in and, act and do the e-verification process for you. Attorney, somebody just asked me, is this something that we do as a firm? Yeah, so as an immigration firm, we definitely do this. And what we do is, there's different ways that we've set it up, um, depending on the business's need. So some businesses are hiring constantly, right? So we're able to just have an ongoing relationship with them. And some businesses are just every few months or maybe even once a year. Um, we will basically be part of the hiring process. Um, policies and procedures is definitely the way to go for any business to be successful. So you want to go back to your policy and procedures and the steps that you want to follow when you're hiring someone. And you, what would happen is when the person is ready to, to start, the step where you want to verify um, whether they are legally, where, whether they have the legal documentation for them to work in the U.S., then you would send us their file, their information. We would be able to speak with them and we would be the ones to actually sign off on the I-9 as well as the e-verification. So just to make it clear, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, is that the I-9 form is not going anywhere. It's still there. You still have the obligation to do the I-9 because that's federal, right? But now the e-verification is also a requirement for businesses in Florida with more than 25 employees. And it's optional for any business in the US. Got it, thank you so much for that attorney. Um, okay, so let's move on to compliance. So um, as we stated, the bill is effective as of July 1st of 2023. So you wanna make sure that you are using the e-verification but the sanctions, actually, they're giving you a year. So okay. you will be sanctioned um, starting July 1st of 2024, mm -hmm. not 2014, 2024. <laughs> All right. And okay, so at this point, um, just to sum up between the I-9 and the E-Verify attorney, how would you put it as per the so chart? The Form I-9 is a USCIS, which is the immigration agency that adjudicates all immigration applications. Form I-9 is still there. It's still an immigration form that has to be filled out, that has to be kept in your files up until um, we there's a, a federal transition from the I-9 to E-Verify, but that hasn't happened yet, right? So. The I-9 is still mandatory for every single person. Unlike E-Verify, which is voluntary for most employers, except now it's mandatory in Florida for employers that have employees more than, 20, more than 25 employees. And if you're a contractor and you're servicing local governments. Um, the I-9 doesn't require a social security number while E-Verify does. 
Um, the I-9 doesn't require photo ID. Unfortunately, E-Verify does. And there's circumstances where you may have, you may have hired someone, the person leaves, mm -hmm. and then you want to, they're coming back maybe after a sabbatical or there was a contract and you're the new contract that you're starting with the person and you have to re-verify the person's employment authorization. You can use that same I-9 form to do that, but E-Verify, you're not going to be able to. Um, what's interesting is for E-Verify under the Florida law now, you have an obligation to keep each person's file for at least three years after they work for you. While well, that I-9, you don't have that obligation. And that's something that we would also do as a firm because any firm in Florida has an obligation to keep a client's file for at least at least six years after they're done with their representation. Attorney, I see a very interesting question here and I don't know if it has an exact, uh, here goes, it says, if uh, a person has recently received their work permit or residency, and you know, would they appear immediately in the E-Verify system eligible to work? Or how long does the process take for the E-Verify to synchronize with whatever the USCIS is doing on their end? So that's a great question. Unfortunately, we don't know on a practical level how quickly that's gonna happen yet. Um, what I can say is if you went through the immigration process, then that means that you probably had work authorization while your application was pending, which is great. So you should appear in the system as having the ability to work. Has it been updated now to show that that green card was approved or that you went from a green card holder to a citizen that we just have to wait to see how it's gonna pan out. Got it, okay, thank you so much for that. Um, the current social security system, for example, even when you become a green card holder, it does take quite some time for social security to update your status in their system. And mm -hmm. sometimes you have to go out of your way to update it yourself with them. So we just have to follow up and see um, how the e-verification system is gonna, is gonna deal with that. Understood. So let's say somebody, we need to verify somebody's employment status. We check on e-verify, it doesn't check out. But we see on the USCIS um, website that the person's employment authorization is, in fact, um, approved. You know, do we follow what the USCIS is telling us, or do we still have to do go only by what the computer says to be verified? So that's a great question, and that's when. So, for example, as an immigration attorney, I'd be able to sit down and see because it will vary per person and per case. Um, you know, sometimes you'll have someone with a work permit and then that work permit expires. Um, maybe the green card wasn't approved or there's something that happened where they had the work authorization and then they don't have it. Then later they become a green card holder. So it's really hard to answer that because it will vary on, on the case. It's Got it, attorney. I think I think this is a perfect pause for us to really encourage you to reach out to our firm. Our phone number is 305-371-8846. I'd like to remind you that if you are a participant in today's webinar, you may uh, reach out to us. You will receive um, a consultation uh, for having participated in today's webinar. And um, we can discuss this more into detail regarding your business or the questions you may have about your employees. Okay, attorney, this is now the I-9. So this is just what the I-9 looks like. Um, if you have a business and you've hired anyone, you should know exactly what it looks like. Um, it's a very simple form, but it just takes a lot of details, right? It takes time to fill it out correctly. As you guys know, what the I-9 form is doing is it's verifying someone's identity. It's also verifying whether the person has the employment eligibility. Um, so when you give someone the I-9 to fill out, you'll notice that there's one section where they fill out and there's another section that you fill out. And there's different options of the documentations that they're able to give you. So they need to be able to give you something that identifies them. So it may be a birth certificate, it may be the social security number, it may be 
a driver's license, it may be a passport. And you just follow the chart of the I-9 to make sure that you've identified and you filled out correctly that their identification is correct and that their employment authorization, that they're eligible. Um, you would sign off on it and you would keep it in your files throughout the duration of the employment. So right now there's no obligation for you to keep it after they're no longer employed with you. However, with e-verification, like I mentioned before, you have to keep it for at least three years. Got it. All right. Um, so I think this is what you were explaining to us, that one part is filled out by the employers, one part filled out by the employee. Exactly. Okay. Um, all right. So now to the bigger question, the one where you bring us to a solution on the bigger problems that have arisen from uh, SB seventeen eighteen, and what are what are what are my what are my options? What are my options after this new law has been approved? Um, businesses, business owners don't can still hire right immigrants. Um, you just want to make sure that you have your documentation in order and you're able to document the fact that they have the proper work authorization. Now I put in this, this screen here, which is kind of a breakdown of all of the different work related visas that you're able to sponsor someone for, or someone can qualify for. Um, this is for a lot of different sectors. So for example, you know, the B1 visa, um, that's the tourist visa that you're able to come in for um, for example, meetings or signing contracts. So if you have, for example, a contract you need to sign or you need to negotiate with a foreigner, um, you don't have to be scared. The person is still able to come into Florida. They're still able to come in to have those negotiations, to sit down, to do consultation and for you to sign a contract with them. Now, the H-2A and the H-2B visa, um, those visas, correct, are going to be really helpful for um, like we said, the agricultural sector, the hospitality sector, um, and also the, you know, the construction sector, because these visas are especially for temporary workers. Um, the H-2A is for agricultural jobs, and the H-2B is basically for non-agricultural jobs that are temporary. So as a business, you would the process is you would first go through the Department of Labor to be certified for you to be able to sponsor folks from other countries to be able to come in on a temporary work visa. So a lot of um, agricultural businesses actually take on these H-2A and these H-2Bs because like we've been talking a lot in the media, a lot of people in the U.S., Americans or green card holders, they're not taking these agricultural jobs. They're not taking these seasonal jobs. So if as a business, you're able to show the government, listen, I've tried to hire Americans, but I'm not able to. And here's a group of people abroad that I'm able to bring in and they are able to do this work for me. Once the season is over, then they go back home. Then you will qualify to go ahead and sponsor employees to come in from other qualified countries that we have a treaty with. So it's not any country. First, we have to verify whether the country has a treaty with the U.S. where the nationals will qualify for H-2A or H-2B visas to come in and work on a seasonal, a seasonal basis. Um, another great example of a temporary work, for example, are the ski resorts, right? So the ski resorts in the US, they're not hiring folks um, year round. Or a hotel in, the Key, in Key West, they don't necessarily need the same workforce all year because they have a high season and they have low season. Um, even restaurants have high seasons and low seasons. So if you're able to show that you have a temporary need for a temporary worker to come in, then, and you're not able to find workers in the US to fill those positions, that's when you'd be able to benefit um, with the H2A or the H2B program. If for any reason, these programs don't fit your needs. And if you go back to the other slide, Catalina, yeah. prior to this one, 
you'll see that there's also different kinds of visas available just depending on what your need is. You know, someone maybe, maybe you want someone to come in for a training session. Um, maybe you are trying to sponsor someone that's an athlete and you want them to come in for um, an athletic season. Um, maybe you're in the entertainment sector and you want to sponsor someone to for um, one year so that they have a tour in the U.S. Um, maybe you have someone who's interested in doing an investment opportunity with you in your business. So really depending on the professional and the professional need, for the most part, there is a visa available for people to benefit from and take advantage of. Okay, thank you so much for that, attorney. I think it's uh, very refreshing to see that we do have options. Um, once again, uh, thank you so much for discussing the topic of SB 1718, attorney. We're so um, grateful to have gotten this information, which is very valuable in today's climate. Um, as I said earlier, you do have the opportunity of getting a consultation with us through our uh, phone lines, our email address, or our website. You can reach out to us directly. Let us know that you are a part of today's webinar, and we'll be happy to provide you with a uh, free consultation so that we may discuss this topic further or any other immigration topic that might um, be a part of your life right now. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, attorney. Anything else that you'd like to, to say before we head out? Yeah, so um, we are doing these monthly webinars and we are doing our best to really cover the topics that you would like us to cover. So if there's something that you're really interested in us speaking about, so for example, um, if you want us to discuss fiance visas or if you'd like to talk about work permits um, or if you want a discussion on you know, the music industry, or if you are a sport agent and you want to discuss the different options that you have for your athletes. So there's a, a whole immigration world out there and we're happy to kind of focus on the topics that you guys want us to focus on. So please, you know, send us an email, comment on our social media, send us an inbox on the topics that you'd like us to cover more and we'd be happy to kind of cater um, to you for that. That is absolutely right. Thank you so much for the clarification on that attorney, because we do cover a variety of topics, maybe much more than you actually think um, can be covered by a law firm that specializes in immigration. You don't have to do your process alone. There are resources available for your assistance. Our attorney is always more than happy to, to better serve you in that regard. And the team of uh, Elise Law Firm is also readily available to answer your concerns and to schedule you in for your consultation. So thank you once again for uh, joining us today and have a great evening. Bye everyone. See you guys next time. Bye.